acutely aware of how important highly sophisticated analytical and quantitative skills are in today's economy. That's why they are spending unprecedented time and resources educating their own children. The middle class is spending more on schooling too, but in the global educational arms race that starts at nursery school and ends at Harvard, Stanford, or MIT, the 99% is increasingly outgunned by the 1%. The result is something that economists Alan Kruger and Miles Korat call the Great Gatsby Curve. As income inequality increases, social mobility decreases. The plutocracy may be a meritocracy, but increasingly you have to be born on the top rung of the ladder to even take part in that race. Has a sort of internal logic which is more sophisticated than the one that I could impose on it analytically. So that Piero is coming from the paintings I made before as much as from Watteau and Malvolio's lower legs are coming from those paintings that I made before. Yeah. So I also really started to enjoy this composition of these two kind of like trunk-like lower yeah. legs and that you go, th go through them, you can look through them or you can look at them and look around them and using that as a device for having things behind or, or not behind. A few years from now, I hope we're more sophisticated on uh, what, how that line should be drawn. You know, a while back on my second channel, I made a video called Be Hated, which was kind of about my thoughts about pushing back against misinformation, that we should see anything that is wrong in the world and we should do our best to, to fight it. So you should not be liked by everyone because there are some people out there with bad ideas and you should be pushing back against them. That was essentially my thought. But since then, I feel like my views have softened a little. And now I think of our pushing back against misinformation a little bit like an immune system. Obviously, it's a problem if your immune system is weak, if it, if it doesn't respond to anything. But it's also a problem if your immune system is too strong. And in your after-tax income for the most sophisticated taxpayers and for the highest income taxpayers, uh, they'll actually have a multiplicity of choices about how to structure their businesses uh, in order to reduce taxes the most. Uh, in general, for, for most people, the preference will clearly be to form a pass-through business uh, and be a sole proprietor or be a partner in a partnership. Uh, but at higher income levels, uh, certain, certain individuals will want to form a C-corporation. In order to be a C-corporation, it's actually not that hard to, to incorporate. Uh, if you already have uh, a pass-through business, uh, like a, an LLC or an S corporation or a partnership, all you need to do to turn into a C corporation is check a box on a form. We've really never seen the tax rate that applies to wage earners be very different from the tax rate that applied to partners and partnerships or sole proprietors. Egg pasta rather than the dried stuff is much more sophisticated. And yes, it does have a place in my kitchen. It has a worktop all to itself with flashing show business lights and a upbeat tune like Beethoven's Ode to Joy playing every time you turn it on. It's fantastic. Now in episode three of Oak Cook, I made penne carbonara and I used dried penne because it's much easier for the amateur chef, but I'd like to try it again using this machine and making fresh egg penne. Well, that was a lot of fun and thank you for taking part. Some of those gadgets are truly impressive. Some of them, in my opinion, are a senseless waste of humanity's capacity for endeavour and invention. But never mind, if you're like me and you enjoy no-nonsense food made with no-nonsense equipment, then check out my new show, O-Cook, on Prime Video. Thank you for watching. Goodbye. It's every bit as sophisticated as other forms of English. Linguists tend to avoid the term dialect altogether. Instead, many opt to call different forms of speech varieties. This way, languages are seen as groups of varieties. So the English language is made up of varieties including Standard British and American English, AAVE, Nigerian English, Malaysian English, and many others. Each has its own unique history and characteristic pronunciation, vocabulary, and grammatical structures. But the dividing line between varieties is murky. Human language, in all its cross-pollinating, ever-evolving glory, naturally resists the impulse to sort it into neat buckets. I was amazed at how he used sophisticated mathematical language freely. 
I was beginning to form the impression that Terence preferred to use analytic, non-visual methods in preference to making extensive use of visual imagery. Here's one of Terence's actual written solutions to a question that says, the length of each side of a square is increased by 3 meters. The area of the new square is 39 meters squared more than that of the original square. How long are the sides of the new square? Terence correctly finds that the length of the new square is 8 meters. The next set of questions given to Terence include, suppose you decided to write down all the numbers from 1 to 99,999. How many times would you have to write the number 1? They're like sophisticated emotions, and they include things like nostalgia, compassion, and embarrassment. Yes, humans experience these emotions, but I, I mean, my cat definitely doesn't get embarrassed. So knowing this, they conducted a few studies in Spain and the Canary Islands, and all you need to know is that at the time, folks in mainland Spain tended to look down on people in the Canary Islands, and folks in the Canary Islands tended to resent the people in mainland Spain. It's your classic in-group, out-group divide. Anyhow, they gave everyone a list of characteristics and asked them to pick the ones that best applied to either their own group or to the other group, and the list contained both primary and secondary emotions to choose from. Sure enough, when it came to those secondary, very human emotions, People thought that they applied better to their own group than to the other group. Increasingly sophisticated models and techniques like DNA barcoding. Maybe there are 40,000, maybe even a million, which would place them second only to arthropods. Maybe even more. So rather than lifting up a rock to find a friendly beetle, you might find the most average animal by digging up some soil in your garden for some mostly microscopic worms. 8 to 10 million might also be too low an estimate for the total number of animal species. Despite ruminating on it for a whole episode and some excellent math, we're still not 100% sure what counts as an animal. We know that an animal is multicellular, eats, sexually reproduces, and moves, or is at least descended from an animal that could do all that. But the more we learn about different life forms, the more we question what really separates them from animals. We sophisticated and developed and complete. And anything we do is just a subtraction. It's because we live in such a biologically rich planet. When we go to Mars, we have an opportunity that we don't have on Earth. Here's a planet that's died. Here's a world that's not full of biology, probably doesn't have any at all. Well, there, we can actually do something to help. Once there are large human settlements on Mars that have significant industrial capability, we could actually start addressing ourselves to the question of transforming the Martian environment itself, terraforming Mars, as it's called, because Mars was once a warm and wet planet, and it could be made so again through human engineering efforts. With daytime temperatures in the Martian tropical zone, averaging around zero degrees centigrade, and with an atmosphere only 1% as thick as Earth's, Exposure to these elements by a human without a spacesuit would be instantly fatal. And introducing more sophisticated tactics, like roadside bombs and suicide attacks. Enlisting diverse groups, even those that didn't share their strict religious beliefs, made it possible for the Taliban to take territory in many parts of the country. For funding, they relied on familiar tactics, taxing highways and trading poppy. Plus, they continued to have help from Pakistan, who not only protected Taliban leaders, but also armed, funded, and trained their fighters. By 2008, the Taliban controlled huge swaths of rural Afghanistan and even threatened some cities. And as Commander-in-Chief, I have determined that it is in our vital national interest to send an additional 30,000 U.S. troops to Afghanistan. In 2009, the U.S. responded by sending a surge of troops for 18 months. They cleared major cities, but couldn't dislodge the Taliban from the rural areas. A newer, more sophisticated form of cancer therapy is known as targeted therapy. As its name suggests, targeted therapy is designed to attack cancer cells specifically, while leaving normal tissue unaffected. Targeted therapy represents the future of cancer treatment, but it's yet to live up to its potential promise. 
Of the over 600,000 people in the U.S. with metastatic cancer last year, only 9 in 100 were even eligible for a targeted therapy. And of these, only five derived any benefit from the drug. With all the knowledge we have gained about cancer, why is it that we still have so few effective targeted therapies? The beginnings of sophisticated argumentation, pro and con legal abortion. So New York was a really interesting state because it had one of the very strictest abortion restrictive laws in the country. The original New York law made an exception only for the life of the woman. And so abortion was a crime unless it was necessary to save a pregnant woman's life. There were movements in various states, New York is a perfect example of it, to either repeal or modify abortion statutes that were already on the books. The creation of our first sophisticated mark making on the cave walls of Lescaux. It's not a coincidence that we've gone from documenting our reality on the cave walls of Lescaux to the walls of Facebook. And in a very meta experience, you could now book a trip to see the walls of Lascaux on the walls of Facebook. Approximately 10,000 years ago, men and women began to array themselves with makeup. They started to self-decorate. But this wasn't for seductive purposes. This was for religious convictions. We wanted to be more beautiful, purer, cleaner, in the eyes of something or someone that we believed had more power than we did. The most sophisticated flood prevention project in the world. The Netherlands has a long history with water management. The country lies along the delta of three major European rivers, and nearly a quarter of its territory is below sea level. This geography makes the region extremely prone to flooding, so much so that some of the earliest Dutch governing bodies were informal water boards that coordinated flood protection projects. But after the storms of 1953, the Dutch government took more official measures. They established the Delta Commission and tasked them with protecting the entire southwestern region. Focusing on densely populated cities, their aim was to reduce the annual odds of flooding below 1 in 10,000 about 100 times as safe as the average coastal city. Adventure story, but most of all, it's an astonishingly sophisticated analysis of what the internet is doing to us and what that means for our social orders. Like from the way internet platforms use our attention to the way online experience can both humanize and dehumanize others, your book really captures what now feels like for me. I mean, obviously you didn't see a global pandemic coming when you were writing the book, but you did see something coming. And so even though A Beautifully Foolish Endeavor isn't about a pandemic, it has helped me to understand contemporary human life as something more than merely foolish, even if less than merely beautiful. More sophisticated habitats could be built above land with a thick layer of water to absorb most of the radiation. However, transporting the enormous amounts of water and materials needed to build these habitats would be extremely expensive. If the first Martian habitats are to grow into large cities, the settlers will need to use the local materials found on Mars. Luckily, Mars has a large amount of useful resources. The surface of the planet contains metals like iron, magnesium, and aluminum, while power could be harnessed from the sun. Oxygen is present in the planet's atmosphere and ice buried beneath the surface could supply all the water needed. These offenses are committed worldwide by perpetrators ranging from sophisticated state-sponsored divisions in countries like North Korea, Russia, and China to that weird kid living in his parents' basement across the street. 
Since their inception, personal computers have evolved into a life-changing mod con that allows us to do everything from watching movies to paying bills without even leaving the couch. Criminals, however, are making the net more dangerous than shopping on Black Friday. It's also a bit disheartening when the inventor of the World Wide Web is now warning of an imminent digital dystopia. On that bright ray of sunshine, here's a rundown of some of the most darkest types of online wrongdoing. I'm more sophisticated. I heard from several legislators just this last week. I hosted a Facebook Live conversation with County Executive Mark Elridge on the Rockville campus and connected with Councilmember Sidney Katz in downtown Rockville. How the college is preparing students for the future of work was a topic of interest to both of these elected officials who look intentionally towards the future and the needs of local businesses. I'm grateful that they continue to look to the college to fulfill the county's workforce development needs. Sometimes we can learn a lot about the future by looking to the past, and my guest tomorrow night would help us do that. Dr. Neil Nakadati, a former professor of mine, would be my presidential dialogue series guest. Dr. Nakadati will examine three generations of Japanese Americans and their experiences in the U.S. Evitable byproduct of any sophisticated artificial intelligences that we design. Further, one concern I have is that consciousness could be outmoded by a sophisticated AI. So consider a super intelligent AI, an AI which by definition could outthink humans in every respect, social intelligence, scientific reasoning, and more. A super intelligence would have vast resources at its disposal. It could be a computronium built up from the resources of an entire planet with a database that extends beyond even the reaches of the human worldwide web. Well, the systems we have now are not sophisticated enough to do that. And so trusting a system that's basically a glorified calculator to make decisions about who should go to jail or who should get a job, things like that, those are you know, at best risky and probably foolish. We used multiple sophisticated bot detection algorithms to find the bots in our data and to pull them out. So we pulled them out, we put them back in, and we compared what happens to our measurement. And what we found was that, yes, indeed, bots were accelerating the spread of false news online, but they were accelerating the spread of true news at approximately the same rate which means bots are not responsible for the differential diffusion of truth and falsity online. We can't abdicate that responsibility because we, humans, are responsible for that spread. Now, everything that I have told you so far, unfortunately for all of us, is the good news. The reason is because it's about to get a whole lot worse. And two specific technologies are going to make it worse. And I think you already see what a great storyteller she is. I mean, it's such a sophisticated picture that many mm. believe it's actually by her father, even though the picture's signed and dated. <laughs> because at this time, she is painting in her father's studio. So she's trained alongside her three mm. brothers. Um, but we know from a letter of 1612, just two years after this picture was painted, that um, her father Orazio writes to someone in Florence saying, um, my daughter's you know, a fantastic painter, she's been painting independently for three years and she has no equal. Um, and you know, this picture is really testament to that. This trendy and sophisticated metropolis is a modern and diverse city and a hub for many fascinating museums, sports venues and other cultural institutions. Many of these are on the Big Day Peninsula, including the Waterslide Norwegian Maritime Museum and the Viking Ship Museum, with Viking ships from the 9th century. Before we get into the top 10 things to do in Oslo, we've included links in the description to various discount codes and links to resources of things to do, so make sure you check those out. At number 10 is the Viking Ship Museum. This is home to the world's best preserved Viking ships, which, unusually, were used as grave sites for important members of Viking society. Both the ships and the burial findings are on display, including a large, beautifully intricate wagon, amazingly well-maintained clothing items, and the skeletons themselves. The Vikings have played a huge part in Scandinavian culture, and the Viking Ship Museum is a perfect place for a visit. They're more sophisticated, and still to this day, I'm amazed how sweet the cookie is, but like how delicious anyway, and how popular it is. 
And it's really a cookie that adults and kids love. My little boy loves it. He's not a chocolate fan, so it's a great cookie to have out there for people who don't want a chocolate chip cookie or something like that. I would eat it on its own, and it's actually excellent frozen, I have to say. Like, it's really good that way. They're also great for um, parties. We make small versions of them that you can just take two bites of and walk away. So initially, when I was making the oatmeal cookies, they were coming out like very thick and dense. <laughs> when I was developing the recipe, I was amazed how much sugar and how much butter I had to put into it so that they would actually like just hit the oven and spread like a pancake like right away and not bake like a chocolate chip cookie, you know, that's like thicker. So the reason why I combine the baking soda with boiling water before adding it to the dough is because most baking sodas are what's called double act. Ink, ink style that was one of the most sophisticated, detailed pen and ink styles because he was trying to be a, an engraver with the medium of pen and ink, which is almost yeah. impossible. And then Bernie looked at Franklin Booth, Doré, they were huge influences on him, the old EC comics, the old Mad Comics before it was a Mad Magazine, uh, before it was a magazine, and early 1930s universal horror films, the early 1930s ones were, were the really great ones. At least those, and then he fused them together. Oh, he got he didn't go to art school. He got his education from the famous artist mail order school that we were looking at last episode. That's how he learned and from John Nagy's television art instruction where John Nagy would teach you how to learn the simple forms and shade. Even today's sophisticated moviegoers still lose themselves to the screen. And filmmakers leverage this separation from reality to great effect. Now, imaginative people have been having fun with this for over 400 years. Giambattista della Puerta, a Neapolitan scholar in the 16th century, examined and studied the natural world and saw how it could be manipulated. Playing with the world and our perception of it really is the essence of visual effects. So digging deeper into this with the Science and Technology Council of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, reveals some truth behind the trickery. Whale songs are one of the most sophisticated communication systems in the animal kingdom. Only a few species are known to sing. Blue, fin, bowhead, minke whales, and of course, humpback whales. These are all baleen whales, which use hairy baleen plates instead of teeth to trap their prey. Meanwhile, toothed whales do use echolocation and they and other species of baleen whales make social sounds, such as cries and whistles, to communicate. But those vocalizations lack the complexity of songs. So how do they do it? Land mammals like us generate sound by moving air over our vocal cords when we exhale, causing them to vibrate. Baleen whales have a U-shaped fold of tissue between their lungs and their large inflatable organs, called laryngeal sacs. Organic, and generated through sophisticated algorithms to make thousands of calculations for each search in a fraction of a second, based only on the relevance of a page to a user's query. Google never accepts payment from anyone to be included in organic search results, or to alter a page's ranking in any way. When you use Google Search, ads may appear with your search results but they are clearly labeled, so they are easy to distinguish from the rest of the page. So now you know that Google crawls the web to discover new content, Google indexes the content, categorizing it like a catalog, and Google's ranking systems scan the index to serve the most relevant results to users. If you'd like to learn more about how search works and how to improve your site's visibility in Google Search, Follow the Google Webmaster Guidelines. Advantage. Their skeletons had a special feature that mammals lacked, a sophisticated system of air sacs. These sacs were basically pockets of soft tissue that were connected to the lungs. Think of them as biological balloons. Some of these sacs sat in the body cavity next to bones, usually in the neck, back, and hips, but others ran inside the bones themselves. These air sacs helped shape the dinosaur's skeleton and allowed the bones of the biggest dinosaurs to remain light without sacrificing strength. How do we know that extinct dinosaurs had 
had these sacs? Partly because the non-extinct dinosaurs have them too. Birds have a similar system of sacs that help draw air into their tiny lungs while also making their skeletons remarkably light. And if you compare the respiratory system of birds to those of the giant dinos, you'll see the resemblance is pretty striking. In sauropods, for example, the vertebra of the back and neck have the same pockets and divots we find in birds today where these air sacs were attached. Oh, you're suddenly watching an exponentially more sophisticated film. Lucky you. Not to mention the last shot of the Great Train Robbery was unique in its own right. It's a medium close-up of one of the bandits, much closer than any shot we've seen so far, and he's looking directly at us. He raises his pistol, aims at the camera, at us, and fires. The size, scale, and direct gaze of this shot was startling at the time, and influential enough that Martin Scorsese stole it for a key moment in Goodfellas. And if it's good enough for Marty, it must be pretty good. Marty, if you're watching, can I call you Marty? Let me know in the comments. No single filmmaker did as much to shape narrative film grammar in the first decade of motion pictures as Edwin S. Porter. He uncovered a series of tools and techniques, the first rules of narrative film language that subsequent directors would use, modify, and expand upon for decades to come. Prior to the life of the American Fireman and the Great Train Robbery, films were almost all constructed in a strictly linear fashion. Complete scene followed by complete scene. Boring! But after Porter, filmmakers became more adept at telling stories, using shots and cuts to engage the audience and keep them coming back for more. It wasn't some super sophisticated artificial intelligence like they'd sort of been led to believe. Um, it wasn't this like super slick mathematical model. It was in fact an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and if you'll forgive me for being blunt, quite a crappy one um, at that. So this Excel spreadsheet, it had errors all over the place, right? There was, there was bugs in the data, the formulas were a mess. In fact, the maths in this spreadsheet was so bad that the judge would eventually rule it unconstitutional, right? I love the idea of there being unconstitutional maths. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think that, you know, ultimately, the moral of this story is that once you kind of dress something up as an algorithm or as, um, you know, a bit of artificial intelligence, it can take on this air of authority that makes it really hard to argue with. Um, so I thought that I would um, leave you with a, a, a much more positive example. If they're sort of sophisticated enough. Deep play, it turns out, is, you know, looks like the kind of thing that um, busy people can't afford, but it helps put them back in touch with the things that they love most about often very challenging work. You know, these are all things that I learned about while I was w w writing the book, which have made a huge difference in my own life. Think about the research, the technology, the sophisticated protocols, the care that goes into every single case for someone who has cancer. Nobody says it's too complicated, it's too sophisticated, it's too labor intensive. And so it should be for mental illness. And some people simply despair. Why bother? People don't get better anyway. But it's not true. Again, it's stigma in disguise. We have demonstrated that we have treatments that work. We can even show that these evidence-based treatments are effective in communities that historically have not had access to mental health care. Specialized fields or sophisticated vocabulary, so that's not really what is required. So how do you do it? What is required? Well, I want to give you three areas to focus on when you're learning and interacting with native speakers. The first is work on eliminating your accent. I'm aware I said eliminating, um, it should be at least minimizing it. Um, this is, in my opinion, the most overlooked aspect of language learning today, uh, but it's also the most important one to reach what I call native speaker level or speaker-like level. If you communicate without an accent or almost without an accent, this changes how natives behave towards you unconsciously, and it also gives you an ability to to adapt a new self-image. We need to be like a pilot of a sophisticated aeroplane coming into land in deep fog on autopilot. The pilot's senses may tell them that a dreadful collision is imminent, but their reason knows that the sums have been done correctly and that a smooth landing is, despite the darkness and the awful vibrations, definitely about to unfold. To get better, which really means to stop dreading bears everywhere, we need to spend more time thinking about the specific bear that we once saw.
The impulse is to focus always on the fear of the future, but we need instead to direct our minds back to the past and revisit the damaging scenes with compassion and in kindly company. A consequence of not knowing the details of what once scared us is a fear of everything into the future. Because now we have sophisticated ways to test medicines. We've got sophisticated ways to test for toxicity without using a whole animal. We have organ on a chip and we have computational tests and we have all sorts of innovative ways that are cheaper, don't involve intense animal care, and we can find out more reliable things by doing experiments in these ways or research in these ways. And then uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, Jane Goodall and I announced uh, just at the end of June that all chimpanzees, whether they're captive or wild, they're gonna be classed as endangered, which means that their use in film, in commercials, in the pet trade, as well as in biomedical research is all gonna be subject to very high levels of scrutiny now. So a big revolution in our relationship with chimps.